Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. You got a Bible with you? If you got a Bible with you, let me see real quick. Bible here counts just as much in my opinion. Okay. Go to James chapter 1. That way you will be there when we get to the text. And I will say this, probably if you've not been bringing a Bible, we've got some up here if you want one. Maybe something that you're going to want to start bringing to church on Sundays. Okay? We may be doing more here in the Bible. All right, so if, if I asked you guys a question, what do you want to be, what do you think the answer would be? I want you to think about that. Because it's really interesting. You know what, if you ask little kids that question, it can get hilarious really quick. I mean, when I ask little kids, and I'm talking the little kids, what they want to be, do you know the things I hear? I, I want to be a cowboy. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a fireman. Sometimes I hear this, I, I want to go grow up and I want to be a mommy. Oh, that gets my heart. That gets me right there. We're doing something well when kids strive and aspire to grow up to be parents. In fact, one kid said a dog. I, I, I want to be a dog. Now, I will say, in the current age we're living in, that was a lot funnier 10 years ago. Now I got some weird adults that are saying, oh, yeah, they can be a dog, but it's cute. But, but then you ask kids as they get a little bit older, and you notice the answer changes. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a teacher. I, I want to be a chemist. And, and one little girl, hey, I want to be famous. And then I get to us older folk, and I ask the question again, what do you want to be? And the answers change again. I want to be loved. I want to be accepted. I, I want to be financially stable and independent. I want to be healthy and respected. In fact, one, one person said, I want to be 10 years old again so I can do it all over again and get it right this time. But do you want to know what I absolutely have never heard, and I mean never heard, when I ask, what do you want to be? I've never heard anybody say, I want to be a slave. Ever. Ever. I've never heard someone say, I want to love people so much more than they're ever going to love me. I've never heard someone say, I want to be the kind of person that forgives the people that have hurt me. I've never heard, I want to be a person who suffers well for the glory of God. I've never, ever had anyone tell me that's who they want to be. But, but what do you think, if, if we asked most Christians specifically, if we asked the question, do you want to be Christ-like? What do you think the answer would be? Yeah, I, I think it would be a loud and a proud, yes, yes, that's what I want, that's what my life is all about. I want to be like Christ. However, when it comes to us actually acting like Christ, when it comes to living our life and we actually are supposed to be like Christ, how do you think most of us are doing there? Do we love our enemies? Do we die to ourself? Do, do we carry our cross with grace and humility? Are we the kind of people who will serve and obey God willingly without grumbling and complaining? 
Will we have bad things happen to us? Will we have people who disappoint us and we go, that's okay because it's not about me. How can I glorify God in all of this? Is that who we are? Again, the question, are we actually living like Jesus or are we just saying we want to? All right, this year, we're talking about what it means to actually live out the Christian life in a practical way. And what is it we've said that, that living practical means? It is, being practical is? Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. I am doing a horrible job of pastoring you. Because I'm not getting it through. Being practical, living life God's way. Living life, whose way? God's way. Living life, we believe it is super important that we as a body, that we as a family actually strive to not just learn who God is, but to live according to God's ways, not ours. And we've had sermons. We've had a lot of sermons. Do you remember any of them? I mean, we're, we're, we're halfway through March. I mean, we've had sermons about the problems that the church is actually facing because we now live in a culture that looks at the church, that looks at Christianity, and what do they think of us? Negatively, they look down. One of the worst expectations of the world is that the church is full of hypocrites, full of wicked people, that we are in fact evil and and, and we hate people just because we, we disagree with the way they're living. That we hate people because we call out what the Bible calls sin, we believe is sin, and the world hates us for it. And this is the world you're living in. We've had sermons on living in a culture where sin is just dripping and oozing all around us. You can't turn on the TV. You can't go to the movies. You can't read a book, a magazine, get online, or go out your door without sin just being all around us. We've had sermons about you're living in a culture that calls evil good and good evil. Does this, does this ring a bell to you? Thank you. Do you feel it? Do you remember those sermons? We, we've also had sermons where we said, listen, we've got we to learn what the Bible says about these divisive topics. We've we got to say, what does God tell us? What is the way that we're supposed to be living according to God's word when it comes to issues around mental health, around addiction, sexuality, around politics? And get ready, as this year progresses, the culture is going to get crazier and crazier and crazier, and we want us to think about how are we supposed to be living when the world around us is on fire and everyone is yelling and screaming, and how are we supposed to live? Being practical is living life God's way. That's, that's what we want. That is the heart of your leadership. That is what the Holy Spirit has put on us. And I don't know about you, but th these last two weeks, we have had two weeks of absolutely knockout, phenomenal sermons. Amen? I mean, if you haven't seen those, uh, Scott should be up today. Uh, please do yourself a favor and go and watch it if you've not seen it. Hey, if you were here two weeks ago, guess what? Do yourself a favor. Go back and watch it again. And we are actually, Scott and I talked about it, we prayed about it, and we're forcing Mike to go and record his sermon from last week. He wasn't going to, and we said, you don't have that option, bud. The church needs this kind of preaching. And, and Scott, what he preached on is how we're, it's going to look, how it's going to look for the port, for us, for our family, to become a welcoming church. If the world out there is so evil and so wicked, if everything out there is so hard... How do we become a welcoming church? How do we make sure that there is always room for one more person? 
How are we going to be where we, we, not the preachers, not the elders, but we are going to be so committed to this that we're inviting people to come and sit in the chair that's next to me? And here's what Scott told us. That we need to put the needs and the, un, and the comfort of the unsaved ahead of our needs. And, and, and he said, to be a welcoming church, you're going to want to move around often so you sit next to someone new. So that you can put fresh eyes on the sermon, on the church, on people. That, that if you are one of us, if you belong to the family, that you are going to want to make sure that when guests come into our home, that we are treating them with hospitality, a smile, a handshake, that we're going to make sure that there is a seat at the table for them. And, and so we said for weeks, if you're one of us, we're asking you with all humility, with all love, but we're asking you, move up front. Because when people come who don't belong to us yet, when people are searching for Christ and they walk in that door five minutes late and there's no place for them to sit except in the middle of a row or up front, guess what? It becomes a barrier. When a new family has no place to sit but up in the corner where they feel like they're in a fishbowl and they're uncomfortable, guess what happens? They leave. And they did. And they're not coming back here. But we could have set up here, but no one wanted to. So what we did is we said, let's change the layout to make it more welcoming. But we can do everything we can do to the physical environment. But if y'all don't have the heart to sacrifice, to say, hey, my small cross I can bear on Sundays, is I'll be the person that's uncomfortable so someone else has a spot. And I'm just going to be honest with you, I heard. No one came to me, which bothers me a little bit. No one came to the elders, which bothers me about a bit. But I heard through the grapevine, that famous church grapevine, well, who are they to tell us where we have to sit? I'm not telling you where you have to sit. But I am telling you this is what we need to do if we want to be a welcoming church. Do you want to join us? Do you want to be that kind of a church that we always have room for one more person? And, and by the way, not part of the sermon. If you've got a problem with me, if you've got a problem with Mike, if you've got a problem with Scott, if you've got a problem with the elders, please, please call me. Meet with me. I want to hear it. I want to help us work through it. And guess what? Maybe I'm the problem. I've been a problem before, and I'll be one again, and I hope you have grace to forgive me. But maybe the problem is you need to adjust your vision just a little bit. You've got to soften your heart just a little bit to get on board with what we're trying to do here. Can we all be biblical? I mean, being practical is living life Oh, look at how I'm doing this. Look at how I'm bringing this back into the sermon. This is good preaching, Mike, I'm telling you. The Bible says, if you have a problem with someone, what are you supposed to do? Go talk to them. Stop talking to my wife. Stop talking to your neighbor. Stop talking to someone else and getting everyone upset. And instead, come and talk to us. I know I'm loud. I, I, I know I'm real excitable right now. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate. I'm zealous about this stuff. But if you sit with me in the office, if you sit with me in my house, I am quiet sometimes. I'm loving always. Can we just do life God's way, please? We want to be a safe harbor of security and love for the hurting so they can come to know Jesus. And I just want to say, we want to be a safe harbor of security and love for those who are hurting, even you. Man, we love you. 
We know that life is hard. We know you're suffering. We know that you're scared. We know you're confused about so much in life. And you know what? We've got to start taking the walls down. So I'm taking my wall down. I'm sorry if I'm harsh sometimes. I'm sorry if I've ever given you the impression that you can't talk to me. I don't care how busy I am. I don't care what's going on in life. I don't care how sick I feel. I don't care where I got to be. You matter. And this is your port in a storm as much as anybody else's. So please, let's be practical. Let's live life God's way. Oh, oh gosh, I love it. This is going to be exciting. And then last week, I mean, that Scott did a great sermon, by the way. And then last week, Mike challenged us to think about worship in different ways. That we must have a biblical understanding of what worship is. I mean, you, you know this, but worship is not primarily about songs that we sing. That, that worship is, is not primarily uh, about us even attending a Bible study. It, it's not even us serving other people. That's not what worship is primarily and first. Biblical worship is living a life of sacrifice and obedience before God. And I will tell you something. If you are truly worshiping God, guess what? If, if you're sacrificing your life for the glory of God, guess what? You're going to pray. You're going to come to worship. If you are worshiping God with this kind of a heart, you're going to sing praises to him because you've got so much joy in your heart. If you're worshiping biblically, guess what? You're going to come to the gathering, not because you have to, but because you want to. You're going to come to Bible study. You're going to be studying your Bible at home, and you're going to be coming like the Bereans together so we can get into it. And if you're worshiping with this kind of a heart, you are going to be serving other people. That was the challenge that Mike laid out before us. What in your life do you need to put on the altar and say, you, God, matter more than this? Abraham was going to sacrifice his son, his only son, the son that he loved. Because God mattered more. By the way, when we force Mike to record that sermon and we go online here in a week or two, do yourself a favor if you didn't hear it, go listen to it. If you were here to hear it, go back and watch it again. Seriously. Because biblical worship is doing everything. Biblical worship is doing everything for the glory of God. That's worship. And, and so today, today I want to show us that living practically for God, that doing life God's way, is actually an essential part of the Christian life. Okay, you're already at James chapter 1. I need us to go to, to James chapter 1, verses 21. We're going to read 21 through 25. But first, as you're looking that up, James, of all the New Testament books, is the one that is most focused on living out our faith in a practical way. Of, okay, you have faith, here is what that looks like. James doesn't get into a lot of the theology. He doesn't get into explaining these concepts the way that Peter does or Paul does or even Jude. He just says, okay, you believe, now what? In fact, this is my wife's favorite book. This was the very first book in the Bible she read when we became Christians 20-some-odd years ago. And she goes, I understand now. It makes sense. We are saved to serve. Now, this is supposed to affect me. This, like, if I really have accepted Jesus Christ, then this should change me. And it's like, yeah, you're right. And so she still reads this book constantly and gets more and more and more out of it. Now, the writer of this letter is James, the half-brother of Jesus. Catch this. Before the resurrection, he just thought his brother was nuts. Mom and the boys and the sisters, they went, and they're like, Jesus, come out of there. Stop talking crazy talk. You're not the Messiah. Stop trying to do all these miracles. You're embarrassing us. 
come home and we'll put you in the corner somewhere. Paraphrase. But something happened. You read in the book of Acts, after the death, the burial, and then the resurrection of Jesus, his family met the resurrected Jesus, and it changed everything for them. And James opened this letter by not saying, hey, I'm a servant of God and the brother of Jesus. He goes, I am a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew that his brother, he grew up with watching him, chasing after him, playing, was God in the flesh. And, and James is writing this book to us, to them, to us. Probably in the mid-40s, he's in Jerusalem, and he's writing to Jewish Christians who have been dispersed, have been scattered, have spread out from Jerusalem. And they are suffering, and they are trying to learn how to live our faith out in a practical way. How are we going to go from this place and from our family, and how are we going to do life God's way? So we're going to read the verses, then we'll work through what he's, say, he's telling us. James chapter 1, verses 21 through 25. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he is. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. James begins here by telling us what trusting God looks like with our daily lives. Hey, you're a Christian? Guess what? This is what it is. That you, if you have true faith, that you must put away all the filthiness and all the sin of the world. That you must make the choice to say, I'm not participating in the evil of the world. That's how they live. That's not how I'm going to live. I will live life. I will live life. You guys are fantastic at this. Man, I wish you need to do this more. He says, this is what it looks like. You're going to get rid of all of that. Why? Because there's sin and wickedness and filth all around us. And Christians don't have any part of that. And he says, with all humility, we've got to accept God's word. His revelation to us. His, his, his spoken word, definitely the, 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 the scripture. But by implication, it also means the incarnate word. That we will have Jesus, the words and, and who Jesus is, implanted into our hearts. That means that we are supposed to treasure God's word. That it matters. That we're to love God's word. That we are to, to be humble enough to study God's word. That we will, we will, because we love God and, 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 and the word is in our hearts, that we are going to get good biblical teaching and we are going to transform our lives to live according to its ways. That, that we are going to have enough humility and enough love for God that we're going to say, I don't care what the world says, all I care about is what God says. And that we will be teachable by the word of God. It means that you, as a Christian, must make the decision to allow the Word of God to do its work in us, to transform us, to take us from death into life, to take us from wickedness into righteousness. If we have a true, saving faith in Jesus Christ, it means that we will be fat. 
Oh, fat. I might need to explain this a second, right? Okay, listen, I'm not trying to insult anyone, but I want us to understand what it means to be a Christian. Fat, famous preacher thing, let's do an acronym. Let's, let's take a word and let's put some other words to it. This is what being fat means. You will be faithful, you will be available, and you will be teachable. You will be faithful. God comes first in everything. Available. I'm going to do what God tells me to do, even if it costs me. Even if I have to give up something I want, something I need, and I've got to do what God wants me to do, I will make myself available to do ministry. I will make myself available to glorify God. I will make myself available to be present with God. And that you're going to be teachable. That's a hard one. Because to be teachable means we admit we don't know it all. I don't have all the answers. I just have what I understand through the word of God. And we will share it. And we will trust in the Holy Spirit and the godly men that he has raised up to go through this and to say, this is how we do life. So are you fat? Do you want to be fat? Do you want to get fatter? <laughs> Here all your preachers are losing weight and I'm talking about getting fat. I'm like, I'm nuts. I don't know what I was. I should have come up with a different anagram. But here's the problem that we see in the word. The problem with the Christians back then, guess what? Same problem Christians are facing today. Man, it's amazing how applicable and how relevant and how new God's word can be every day. It's almost like God is talking through this book. It's not old. It's not dusty. It's not cobwebby. It's, it's not dead. This is the living word, and it will speak to you today because their problems, guess what, are our problems, that maybe, just maybe, there are going to be people who are really good at being hearers of the word. There are going to be people that hear it so well that they actually understand it. Like, they could, they could tell me the Greek. They could tell me the Hebrew. They could do all of the, the exegesis of this. They could do the hermeneutics. They, can, they could preach it. But the problem is you have people that do all of that, and guess what? They don't. Do it. James says that's a problem. And, and guess what? The problems that they faced back then are the problems we face today. That people are not living the word. And James is clear that true faith, that saving faith, the faith that God has called us to, goes beyond simply becoming experts at listening to God. I'll say this, we've done a really good job of training everybody to be good listeners. You'll sit and listen to us talk for 40 minutes. You hear the sermons, you, you do the Bible studies, you go online. Man, we can be really good listeners. But are we doers? That's what we got to find out. Because you can truly understand this. You can even believe like the knowledge part of it. But we've not completed it until we become doers of the word. And our relationship with Jesus is, is not something we accomplish simply by reading God's word. This kind of faith, this kind of relationship is not accomplished simply by hearing a lot of sermons. It's not in joining Bible study. It's not gaining more and more and more and more knowledge. Oh, I'm going to study 15 hours a day so I can know the word of God. And this is coming from me who gets what I love doing more than anything else spending 15 hours studying the Word of God, but that's not a relationship with God. Now listen, we need to listen to sermons. We, we need to engage the Word of God in a holy way. We need to understand it, but we also then need to be living it. Once we know the Word of God, we've got to allow it to transform us. We got to live out the kind of life that Jesus actually reveals to us. And, and if we don't live out this kind of a faith, if we are not being doers of the word, guess what? James says, you don't actually have the kind of saving faith that he's talking about. Verse 22. Prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers who delude themselves. Take a second. Sit in that text. 
sit in those words and what that reveals to us. Now in the Greek, I'm going I'm to be honest with you, but prove, prove isn't in the original. But I understand why the translators did it because in the Greek, it simply says this, be doers of the word. And the word be there, be born to do this. Become this. Be transformed to become this. It is all about you were this and now you are this. Have you been transformed? Are you a doer of the word of God? Or are we just listening? The Greek is so clear that, that a Christian will be known by actually how we live out our lives. It's not how we live that saves us. It's being saved will lead to this kind of fruit in your life. And if you are someone who thinks that our relationship with Jesus is found by attending the, attending the gathering, I can make it when I'm available. When there's nothing more important going on, I'll, I'll, I'll come, you know, every other week. I'll, I'll come once a month. I, I, I can do that. Or if you think, man, I'm going to keep the checklist and I'm going to attend every week, and that's it. Guys, that's not it. If you think the Christian life is listening to a bunch of Christian music, man, I got my favorite band, they're on the radio, I don't ever listen to, to secular music, I only listen to Christian music. I only watch Christian TV shows. I don't absorb any of this other stuff. I just wear the right clothing and, and, and I, I say the right words. You know, I, I, never, I never ever say those, those words that would be the $5 jar list. But you're not doing the word without radical transformation in your life, not just the appearance, but in your heart, you are deluding yourself. In the Greek, you're lying to yourself. You have reasoned incorrectly, and you have tricked yourself into thinking this is life with Jesus, and it's not. We can be the kind of people who are doing all of the right things from an outward appearance. I can be associated with Christianity. I can go to the right church and I can wear the right clothing. I can carry my Bible. I can even quote scripture. But if our lives, our actual lives that we are living is still rooted in the desires and the wants and the wickedness of the world, you are deceiving yourself. If we neglect the deeper things of God, the, the, the transformation, the joy, the salvation that comes from Jesus Christ, if we miss all of that, then we are going to miss the radical, revolutionary renewal that true repentance brings into our lives. That true submission, changing our heart and being selfish and saying, I want what I want, and instead I'm turning to God and I'm surrendering and I'm dying to myself. If we miss that, we've missed it all. And, and what's repentance? I, I love this quote. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of heart that leads to a change of action. Listen, you, you can change your mind. Hey, I, I don't want to do this anymore. You can even change your heart. I think that's wrong, but if your life doesn't change, guess what, brothers and sisters? We've not truly repented yet. And the church, the church 2,000 years of all of this, we've accepted this, this cheap grace. We've accepted this, this cheap transformation that... I just say the right things, and that's all that God requires of me. But that's not the word. James explains, he shows us, it, it's hilarious when we get it. He shows us how ridiculous it would be if a Christian was simply a hearer of the word. He says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, 
He's like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror, and for once he, once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately has forgotten what kind of person he was. Trust me, that's hilarious. That is funny. He is trying to show us with like this absurd satire how ridiculous it would be to be a hearer of the word, not a doer of the word. It's like one of you. I am going to go to the mirror in the morning and I'm going to look, look at how good I look. Man. And I am, I, I'm, I'm so good looking. I'm going to look at that mirror. And I'm gonna, I'm, you know, sometimes you glance, like you're walking by a mirror in the house and you glance and you're like, wait, what? I, oh, I wasn't looking at myself. I got something in my teeth. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about in the morning when you're there and you're like, okay, I got to shave or I, I got I to get my hair. Tammy told me the other day, she goes, you got to trim one of your eyebrows, man. It looks horrible. <laughs> like, what? So I, I went to the mirror and I'm like, oh, look at that. Comb, comb, comb. But I had to look. What would it be like if you spent time, 20, 30 minutes, and you're looking at your face, and you're looking at your lips, and your, your nose, and your eyes, your ears, like you are just intently studying yourself. And then you turn away, and you're like, what? I forgot what I was looking at. That's funny. What would we call a person who did that? Excuse me? Oh, old. I'm not going there, brother. You're not old. You guys are wonderful. No, no, no senility here. No. If someone took that much time and effort to look at themselves and they couldn't remember what they look like, we'd call that person foolish. Wouldn't you ask what was wrong with you? Scott Brennan spends an hour looking in the mirror. When you're that handsome, brother, I get it. He walks away and he comes over and he says, Blaine, what, what, what color are my eyes? I forgot. What would you think about his mental state if he did that? Something wrong with him. If you claim to be a Christian, if you have spent any amount of time gathered with us hearing the word of God and you have not experienced transformation in your life if your priorities have not changed if you being all in in this congregation that you've chosen to be a part of to glorify God and to build the kingdom if you can't get over your hang-ups your hurts your problems your whatever issue you got to say my feelings matter less than glorifying God and building the kingdom. If you're not doing the word, guess what? You're foolish. There's something wrong with you. And I don't mean that as insulting as it sounds, because guess what? Their problems are our problems. Their problems are my problems. You see, I'm preaching to myself, not you guys. Man, how am I going to change? When am I going to stop trying to straddle that line between the world and God? When am I going to stop holding on to my hurts and say, you know what, Mike, Mike picked on me yesterday. Can you believe it? Amen. We're at this conference and it's all fun and games until he gets involved and all of a sudden he hurts my feelings. I could get upset. I could get angry that the sermon's really hard. I could get upset that George uses too many big words. I could get upset that there's no pulpit up here. I could get upset that we moved the communion table. I could get upset that we used the wrong communion table. I could get upset that we don't have enough pitch-ins. I could get upset that we have too many pitch-ins. <laughs> but you know what? If I'm a doer of the word, none of my preferences, none of my hang-ups matter because I want to live practical. And living practical means doing life. Oh, man. Amen. I'm telling you, we need to get excited about this because I don't know if you guys know it or not, but we were just running like full steam, and then COVID hit, and then stupid happened, and we lost momentum, and this church, we were kind of like spinning our wheels. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Do y'all feel that for the last couple of years? Guess what, though? We ain't spinning our wheels anymore. 
something's going on here. Something is happening that we're trying to invite you guys to be a part of. We're trying to prepare you. Get ready because God is wanting to do something here through you. And to do that, we got to be all in and we got to get past ourselves and we got to get over ourselves and we got to love one another in a radical way because we got to be ready because there's going to be a whole new church of people needing to hear about Jesus. We need to make space. And you need to be ready to love them. You need to be ready to care for them. You need to be ready to go up and minister to people who are different than we are. We want to be ready. So James warns us to don't just be people that are hearing, don't just look and then walk away and forget, but to be transformed. Because the danger is, the scary part is, it can become us if we're not careful. We can actually slip from being doers of the word back to just being hearers. Hey, I was all in at one point, now I'm just kind of on the edge. I've done that in my Christian walk a few times. I've done that in my Christian walk since I became a preacher here. Man, I'm all in, I'm, I'm all for it, and then something happens and I feel myself just not getting up with the heart to do it for God. Just going through the motions. Thank you, God, for convicting me. Thank you, God, for transforming me. Thank you, God, for never giving up on me. Thank you, God, for giving me chance after chance after chance. And I'm telling you, he's never going to give up on you, and you've got the chance for your life to be transformed again. If you've slipped away and you want to be back in, God's just saying, I've been waiting on you. It's time. So, guys, we, we can be in God's Word, and we can spend all morning here studying. We can spend time praying. We can listen to his sermon. And, and the minute we get out the door, if we're not careful, guess what? We, we forget. I'm preaching, and I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. But you can walk out of here, and you cannot remember a single thing I said if you are not going to be a doer of the Word of God. I don't want that for you. The elders don't want that for you. We want to leave here and be engaged with this, and we want to be changed by this, and we want to be transformed by this, and we want the community to be transformed because of what God's doing here. So we got to learn to apply this to our lives. And, and Charles Spurgeon, when I was studying this, he has two powerful quotes in his commentary. First one is this. He says, I fear we have many such in all congregations. We have admiring hearers. We have affectionate hearers. We have attached hearers, but all the while unblessed hearers because they're not doers of the word. The second story he tells is this. He goes, you know the old story. I I'm half ashamed to repeat it again, but it's so pat to the point. When Donald came out of Kirk, and, and that's just an old Scottish word for church. When Donald came out of Kirk sooner than usual, Sandy said to him, what, Donald, is the sermon done? No, said Donald. It is all said, but it's not yet begun to be done. Think about what he's saying there. Because James goes on and he says this, the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the one who looks at the law of liberty and abides by it, not having become forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. And again, in the Greek, you have a word translated looks intently, and it gives this idea that you make an effort. This does not happen to you against your will. This doesn't happen to you just because you come on Sunday. This doesn't happen just because the elders will get up here and talk and talk and talk. This is you putting in the effort to allow God to transform you. It takes you with God for this to happen. And when he talks about God's law, he's not talking about the law of Moses. He's not talking about rituals and rules that we have to live by. It's not a checklist of I will go to church and I'll wear the clothes and I'll carry the Bible and I'll do this, that, and the other. It is a heart that has been transformed from the world to God. What he's talking about here is the law of grace. What he's talking about is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And what a beautiful way to describe the good news of Jesus. The law of liberty. Because it's in Jesus that we find freedom from our sin. It's in Jesus we find freedom from wickedness in this world. It is by Jesus we find freedom from evil. It is by Jesus that we have freedom from the rightful consequences of my evil. I don't have to be crucified because he did it for me. It's in Jesus that we receive freedom from death itself. You know what? We're all going to die physically someday, but that doesn't bother me as much because guess what? It's not the end of the story. After my body dies, Jesus will come back, and guess what? I get the new body. Pain is gone. Scars are gone. Suffering is gone. Tears are gone. And we have an eternity with God forever. That's freedom. But we're called to abide by it. We are called to live into the truth of God that is found only in Jesus Christ. And this is how we prove our faith. This is how we show that Jesus is real. This is how we show the world that we understand what grace truly is and that we've experienced the blessings of His presence in our life, that our lives are actually transformed. So what does it look like to abide in the Word of God? What does it look like to live out this transformation? I I think the easiest way to understand it is the words of Jesus. When asked what the greatest commandment is, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. True saving faith is a faith that loves God with every part of your being. With everything that we are, we will put God first in our lives. The heart, the soul, the mind, those represent your feelings, your actions, your mind. It is having the will to say, I will do, not just hear. A relationship with God is supposed to be one of complete giving. It's a total giving of self. My will is underneath the will of God. I hold back nothing, and I completely submit everything about me and my life to the lordship of Jesus Christ. But wait, there's more. Not only does this kind of a faith change my relationship with God, this kind of saving faith transforms my relationship with people. If we truly understand grace, if we have placed God's word in our hearts, then without a doubt, it will be seen in how we love others. You see, it's in Christ that we're going to take our natural tendencies of selfishness and and we're going to subvert them. They're going to turn them on their head. And all of a sudden, we are going to become outwardly focused people. We're going to be people that want to serve others more than we want to be served. We want others to get their way if they're holy and godly instead of me getting my way. I am going to want to love, not be loved. I'm going to want to understand, not be understood. I'm going to watch out for the interests and the needs of other people and put them ahead of my own needs. That's transformation, because that's not natural. And if someone hurts my feelings, I will forgive. And if someone hurts my feelings, I will forgive. And if someone hurts my feelings, I will forgive. And if I am asked to give more than I get, then I will give. Oh, I don't want to go to Bible study. I'm not getting a lot out of it. Maybe you're in a season in your life when it's not about what you get out of it. It's what you're getting into it. Maybe there's someone here today, maybe you coming here today, and you've not been here for a while, has actually helped someone else. And in giving to other people, God gives to you. Because to serve in this way, there is no higher calling, and there is no more joyful expression of the love of God that I am used by God for the family of God. You all matter. We need you. We need you to be everything that God wants us to be. But we've got to think more of other people than we do ourselves. So what does this mean for us today? All right, let's ask. Does your life, and be honest with yourself, don't deceive, let's stop deceiving ourselves. Does your life look like a life where you love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. 
with everything about you? Do you truly love others like you love yourself? Do you truly serve others more than you want to be served? How are you spending your time? What place does the Word of God have in your life on a daily basis? Do you pray? How are you engaging with the bride of Christ, the church? Do others see you engaged and friendly and active? Are you doing your job to build up the kingdom of God? Or have you just turned yourself into someone who sits and receives, does your time, and gets out of here as quick as you can? What evidence do other people see that you love like Jesus? That you forgive like Jesus? That you serve like Jesus? That you sacrifice like Jesus? Write those things down. Oh, I don't need to do that. I do great. No, write them down. If you can't explain how you are transformed by the word of God, I am guaranteeing you people aren't seeing it. And you're deluding yourself. What are the things in your life that you need to look at? What are the things that you need to give up? What are the things you need to start doing or you need to start doing them again? What is it in your life that you need to bring into the lordship of Jesus Christ? Is there a relationship that needs to be restored? Is there someone that you need to forgive? Is there anger that you need to let go? Is there a hurt that you need to allow to be healed? Are there Christian disciplines that you need to improve in your life so that you can grow closer to God and to his church? Do you need to commit yourself this day to be all in with God one more time because you're sitting here today and you're realizing, man, I used to be a doer. And I've gotten back to just being a hearer. I come and do my time. I'm not connecting. I'm not loving. I'm not forgiving. I'm not engaging. I'm just here. And Lord Jesus, I am so very sorry for taking your sacrifice and making it not mean more. We're a hard church. Do you know that? I got some guys telling me that a lot. You're a hard church. You actually preach the word. You actually expect people to change. You expect them to surrender. You expect them to serve. You are guiding people through the hardest thing in their lives ever, being countercultural. Because what people want to do is just give me enough Jesus that I can feel good, and I'm going to go home and still be okay living in the world. Brothers and sisters, that's not us. It can't be us. We're going to stand before Jesus someday, and we're going to answer that question. What did you do with what we gave you? And I don't want anyone to ever have attended this congregation and stand before Jesus and say, Jesus, I, I was just a hearer of your word and I deceived myself, but Jesus, my excuse is no one ever told me. I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to challenge you to let God transform your life, even if you are going to have to have pain by separating from the world even if you're going to have to forgive people that have hurt you, even if you're going to have to love people that don't love you. And I'm not doing it because I want this congregation to be famous for being that kind of a church. I don't care what the world thinks of this congregation. I care about your soul. And there are some of you who are playing the game. And I'm afraid that in heaven I won't see you. I don't know. I want to be sure. I want to say, man, I see the transformation in their life. I see the fruit. I see that God is the most important thing for them. And I'm just not sure about some of us. And man, I've not challenged people enough. I've not called you up and said, where have you been? What is the hurt that I can help with? What is the prayer I can give you? And I repent and I am sorry. I am sorry that I've not pastored you better. And I'm going to try. I'm going to try to do so much better, but I'm telling you, you're all going to make the decision today. You've got to decide, are you going to do this or not? Because it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter what Mike does. It doesn't matter what the elders do. If you don't step into this, please, please hear my heart. This matters. 
We're called to be doers of the word, not simply hearers. Is there something we can pray for you about? Is there something we can walk with you through the pain and the suffering? Is there, is there repentance that needs to come on my part? If you have something against me, let me know. Please, let me know. If you have a question, ask. And if you're not quite ready, guess what? It's okay by me if you sit here longer. It's okay with me if you keep coming and you're working through this because we love you and it's okay that you're not convinced today. But hear the word. And then start working through what it's going to take you to do the word. Don't just leave here and forget what I said. If you're not ready, you have a home here. You don't have to be perfect to be loved by Jesus. Thank the Lord, because none of us are. You don't have to do all the things that I say to be a member here, to be accepted here, to be cherished here, to be loved here. Man, you belong. If you don't know that, if you've forgotten that, if we've ever made you feel like you don't belong, hear this today, you belong. But belonging means that I'm going to be in your face. Belonging means I'm going to maybe be annoying. Belonging means I'm going to preach a lot longer than you're comfortable with because I don't care about making people happy anymore. I really, really care about getting as many people into the kingdom of God as as we can. So before I leave, finally, I got a question for you. Who do you want to be? Serious. Think about this. Who do you want to be? Do you want to be a hearer of the word? Or do you want to be a doer of the word? Because as Spurgeon said it, it's now all been said, but it's not yet begun to be done. Before I pray, uh, we've done prayer weird, invitation weird the last couple weeks, and guess what? We're doing it weird today. Because God's doing something here. I'm going to ask the elders and their wives to, to get up and go. Stay here. I don't want anyone leaving this room. Stay here. If you need to make a decision for Christ today, find one of your leaders. If you need prayer, find one of your leaders. And we're going to pray. The team will come up. We'll, we'll play, and we'll give us time. Lunch is over there, but it can wait. Don't sit there if you need prayer because you don't want to be seen. We're family. It's okay. But the other thing I'm going to ask you all to do, maybe you don't want to step out of that aisle. Maybe you don't want to go to one of your leaders. I'm going to ask you to stand up, and I want you to look around you and ask someone close to you, is there anything I can pray for you about? Or if you need a prayer and you don't want to go to the elders, You ask the person next to you, will you pray for me about this? Because you know what? Prayer is not a job to be done by elders. It is a privilege that the church shares to pray for each other and with each other. And I want you guys to be praying for one another. Pray for your husband. Pray for your wife. Pray for your neighbor. Pray for your cousin. Pray for your grandmother. pray, Pray for the kids. Have the kids pray for you. I don't care. But take this opportunity to go to that next step. God's getting ready to do something. We want you guys on board. We want you prepared. We want you equipped. Why? Because we want this congregation to do everything that we're called to do for the glory of God. All right, elders, please stand up. Let's all stand and let's pray. Father God, I do come before you and I thank you. I thank you for the patience of this congregation. I thank you for the love and the grace that they bestow upon me week after week. But more importantly, I thank you for your son, Jesus the Christ, the Savior, the Creator, the Judge. Father God, this was a hard sermon. This was, this was a difficult challenge for us. But Father God, we are up to it. We are not going to shy away from the things of you. We are not going to shy away from the difficult text in your word. We are going to challenge ourselves and one another to be everything you want us to be. 
Father God, in these next few moments, will your spirit move amongst us. May we open up our hearts. May we take down those barriers. May we be vulnerable to one another, but more importantly, vulnerable to you. And may you allow us the experience of what the church is to do, to share each other's joys, to, to share each other's problems and pain. And may we lift one another up to your throne of mercy and grace for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray.